I'd like to welcome you all to the first session of the 51st uh, session of ISL. Uh, this morning we will uh, uh, talk about the topic on the return of uh, cultural properties. This topic is uh, quite very interesting in regarding the international. Uh, before I invite uh, each of the uh, panelists, we have uh, quite around uh, five panelists. Uh, we have two hours. I will give uh, around uh, 15 to 20 minutes for each, and then uh, we will have around uh, 30 or 40 minutes uh, for Q and A comments. Uh, uh, I'd like to bring you a, a bit to the topic of return of properties. Uh, the return of cultural properties or repatriation of cultural property is uh, the returns of cultural uh, artifact or heritage items that have been removed from their countries of origins. It is a complex and multifaceted issue in international law that revolve uh, around returns and repatriation of cultural property that were forcibly removed through looting, whether in the context of uh, imperialism, colonialism, or war, or, and now are held in foreign institution, museum, or private collections. The contest object uh, includes uh, sculpture, paintings, uh, monuments, uh, objects such as uh, tools and or weapons for purpose of uh, archaeological uh, study and human remains. Many countries in Asia and Africa have been uh, actively advocating for the reputation of cultural property that were taken during the colonial period through illicit trade or even in times of conflict in order to reclaim their uh, cultural heritage and promote national identity. Many such cultural artifacts and properties are now held in museum and private collection in Europe and other parts of the world. Many African and Asian states uh, are calling for the returns of this item to their rightful place in order to reclaim their cultural heritage and promote national identity. There have been ongoing discussion about the returns of cultural artifacts that were taken during periods of uh, colonization and conflict. Countries such as, uh, as I can mention, India, China, and Cambodia have been particularly active in seeking the repatriation of their cultural treasures. States such as Nigeria, India, China, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Japan also have their own national legislation which uh, regulate uh, conservation and protection of cultural heritage and repatriation of cultural uh, property. And in terms of uh, in terms of instruments, we have many sums of uh, uh, convention or agreement related to the issue of uh, return of cultural properties. Uh, for example, we have a UNESCO Convention on the Means of uh, Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of uh, Ownership of Cultural Property in 1970. We also have the UNESCO Convention on uh, the protection of uh, underwater cultural heritage in, 19, in 2001. We have also UNIDWA. UNIDWA is a uh, uh, unification of the uh, private is uh, kind of the organization based in, in Rome. You do have a convention on stolen and illegal export cultural objects in 1995. And so now I can say that uh, the topics of return of uh, cultural property is uh, quite uh, interesting and touched in many aspects of uh, international law. So in this uh, panel, we have honor to welcome uh, the panelists. May I introduce to you, we have uh, Dr. George Dawadas from the DICSC. He is regional legal advisor. Please welcome Dr. George. We have also Professor 
Rashmi uh, Sapeka, Dean from VIPS. We have uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar Singh from ISL, as you may know. And also we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Bumika Nanda, uh, assistant professor from uh, Bennett University, uh, Greater Noida. And perhaps there will be another one we will join us later, Dr. Oh, he arrived already. Welcome, welcome. Just uh, we'll introduce you to the audience. I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, Dr. Sinivas Bora, Associate Professor from South Asian Universities. So, yes, please welcome him. So each of the panelists will spend uh, around uh, 15 to 20 minutes, and then uh, when we finish around, uh, uh, I think it's around 10, quite uh, 11, we will have around 30 and 40 minutes for Q&A and comments. So now I first like to invite uh, Dr. George to present on the topic of uh, protection of cultural property in the context of armed conflict and relevant rules under IHL. Please, Dr. John, please. Can you support? Honorable Chair, distinguished members of the, this panel, uh, participants of this annual conference, uh, I would like to express uh, sincere gratitude the ISI for having the ICRC uh, speak about this important topic uh, as part of the conference and for me personally it's always a great pleasure and privilege to address uh, audiences at the ISI so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, today's presentation that I was asked to deliver is related to the protection of cultural property in time of armed conflict. Um, I have chosen uh, this particular topic for presentation because uh, indeed when it comes to the work of the ICRC that I will be briefly touching upon in the, in the coming minutes uh, is something that is focusing very much on armed conflict situations and other situations of violence including its legal regulation uh, and I think it's important to flag that this topic of cultural property protection is very much central uh, and a, a very important topic as well. So maybe very briefly about the session plan, I will start by introducing indeed what armed conflict situations are and what is the role and mandate of the ICRC, why the ICRC speaks about the protection of cultural property. I will then turn to discussing some of the dangers that cultural property uh, is exposed to in the situation of armed conflict. I will then very briefly recap uh, some of the normative frameworks that regulate this issue in international law. Um, I will be then specifically focusing closely related to the subject matter of this panel as well. Uh, specific rules that we have in international law are applicable to armed conflict situations that regulate and in certain instances prohibit export of the cultural property from territories affected by armed conflict situations and indeed the obligation of the high contracting parties to some of the important international instruments to return such property that has been uh, in an illegal manner exported from the territories affected by armed conflict. And last but not the least, I will try to uh, then highlight and give certain examples uh, indeed when international humanitarian law has been respected and uh, cultural property has been returned to the places of origin or indeed other measures that the states have taken in compliance with their international obligation with the ultimate purpose of strengthening protection for cultural property in time of armed conflict. In the, in the interest of time, uh, because uh, we have very limited time for this discussion and we have uh, many excellent uh, speakers with different topics to discuss, I will be very briefly touching upon uh, the notions of armed conflict and international humanitarian law as the body of law that regulates behavior of the parties in time of armed conflict. Uh, as uh, the audience uh, is aware, this body is one of the oldest um, uh, among the contemporary codifications of international law uh, and dates back to the end of the 19th century, but of course some of the notions and ideas uh, even predate this and go as, uh, as far as ancient times. So 
So contemporary codification of international uh, humanitarian law indeed is concerned on alleviating suffering of persons affected by armed conflict situation as well as protecting some of the property uh, and infrastructure that is critical uh, to the survival of uh, the mankind as well as of particular significance such as cultural property. International humanitarian law tries to achieve this by limiting uh, the freedom of belligerents to which measures they can resort in armed conflict situations and indeed uh, prohibit certain types of behavior. In this sense, we have sort of two pillars of protection. On the one hand, it is the regulation of conduct of hostilities. So what are the means and methods of warfare that parties to an armed conflict can legally resort to? And on the other hand, these are indeed rules as well that regulate how a party that has control over part of the territory of certain segments of populations has to administer that territory and respect for personal dignity as well as certain kinds of objects. Under these both pillars of protection, we have rules that are indeed relevant for cultural property protection as well. Perhaps before we turn to looking at specific rules and what these rules of international humanitarian law say, a few important caveats when it comes to applicability of international humanitarian law. This body of law, because it counterbalances on the one hand principle of humanity and all the other considerations that are relevant to limiting the consequences of war, it is also informed by this fundamental and underlying principle of military necessity, which uh, accepts the armed conflict as a reality and thereby does not mean as such to completely tie the hands of the fighting parties to achieve their purpose, which is to militarily overcome their enemies. So every single rule of international humanitarian law, in order to remain realistic and pragmatic, does take into account imperatives of military uh, necessity as well. Because of this particular consideration, and because it would not be a good idea to automatically apply all these rules, some of which are a bit more relaxed of the standard that we have typically applicable in time of peace, uh, application of international humanitarian law is limited in time and space. It applies exclusively to armed conflict situations, and not to situations that fall short of the definition of what we regard as armed conflict. And this type of situations, we have two. On the one hand, we have an international armed conflict, and on the other hand, we have a non-international armed conflict. The two categories being distinguished by the parties who are fighting. On the one hand, in the context of an international armed conflict, we have two or more states fighting, while in the context of a non-international armed conflict, we have resort to armed violence, which is of sufficient intensity, which is between the organized parties, such as a state on the one hand and a non-state entity, an armed group, for example, uh, or between such armed groups that are sufficiently organized and are resorting to violence that is of sufficient intensity. International humanitarian law binds all parties to an armed conflict. Uh, be it a state or a non-state armed group, and certain rules also that we shall see uh, in uh, uh, this presentation also have to do with obligations in certain contexts of third states, which are not parties to armed conflict, but nevertheless have certain duties or roles to play, either to ensure respect for international humanitarian law by the fighting parties, or because, for example, if they have maybe uh, cultural property exported illicitly from an occupied territory has ended up on their territories, they will have certain types of obligations as well to take certain actions. And indeed, uh, the last point being that most of international humanitarian law obligations, as I have explained, are applicable uh, for the duration of the conflict. So we do have marking of the beginning of an armed conflict and its end, and the law is meant to apply exclusively to that period. But nevertheless, we do have certain obligations that are of continuous nature. So even when armed conflict has ended, which is to say the general close of military operations or conclusion of peace, in this case as well, if there are certain humanitarian issues that continue to be emanating from the armed conflict situation, 
they have to be nevertheless compliant with by the parties. One example could be if a prisoner of war is not released or repatriated for the duration of their continuous internment, relevant rules of humanitarian legal law will be applicable to them. The same holds true very much to obligations, for example, of continuous nature, such as the obligation to return cultural property that has been uh, illegally exported, for example, from the uh, uh, territory occupied by the belligerents. Now, what are the main dangers that cultural property uh, is exposed to in the context of an armed conflict? Uh, very obviously, this has to do with damage, destruction, but also international law is very much concerned of other forms of misappropriation of cultural uh, property as well. In spite of this, uh, and very much related to the dangers as well, it remains an unfortunate reality that which holds true also for other areas of international law and international humanitarian law as well. Some of the violations do nevertheless occur as well. And in the context of cultural property um, uh, protection as well, we have in practice observed that sometimes attacks on cultural property are deliberate in nature, precisely because of the symbolic value that is attached to them. So particularly in armed conflict situations that have a specific dimension and background to it, uh, which are closely related to the identity of the groups or uh, states uh, that are fighting as well, may indeed be particularly affected as well. So in this sense, uh, it is important to maintain that challenges do remain, but as we shall see now moving forward, the international normative framework is relatively complete and sufficient to address many of the concerns that are indeed uh, faced uh, by cultural property protection in our conflict. So, some of the key instruments I have mentioned, there are quite a few. Uh, some of it was also um, mentioned by the um, uh, uh, eminent uh, chair of this panel as well. Uh, let me start from the Hague regulations, uh, which date back at the end of the 19th century. Already some of the rules for the cultural property protection have been included in the regulations. Of course, the most important rules that have to do with protection of armed, uh, cultural property in armed conflict is codified in a specific international treaty, which is the 1954 uh, Hague Convention, with its optional protocol number one, um, as well as rules of the additional protocols of 1977 to the Geneva Conventions, as well as second protocol to the uh, Cultural Property Convention. Importantly, some of the uh, violations of the rules prohibiting attacks on cultural property and other aspects are nowadays also codified under the Rome Statute as international crimes. Uh, which are subjected also to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court as well. And we have seen in practice also that some of the cases have dealt with uh, destruction of cultural property in the context of armed conflict. Important also to highlight that in addition to treaty and uh, codified rules as well, customary international law also regulates certain behavior in relation to cultural property. Uh, and as an example, of course, customary law is not meant to be codified, but a study that my organization has conducted upon the request of states also uh, highlights that there are certain rules and sufficient uh, state practice and opinion theories uh, exist to actually conclude that those rules are part of customary law as well. Now, a quick snapshot of some of these instruments and, and what they seek to achieve. Um, their coverage as well uh, as uh, how they interact with each other. Uh, the Hague Convention itself from 1954 is applicable primarily in the context of an international armed conflict. As we said, this is armed conflicts between two or more states, as well as total or partial occupation of states uh, by another state. Uh, Main obligations um, that are codified in Article 4, which has to do with the duty to respect cultural property, are also applicable in the context of a non-international armed conflict. So that provision will be applicable to all types of situations, including territorial non-international armed conflicts. Um, and indeed, uh, they highlight respect and protection for cultural property in armed conflict situations. 
We have two layers of protection, which is general protection afforded to the cultural heritage as a civilian object in the context of hostilities, for example. But in addition, also we have what is called a special protection regime, which is applicable to a narrower category of cultural property. And we have specific legal regulation and regime applicable to that special protection. Um, other issues uh, such as transport of cultural property, their marking in time of armed conflict, protection of personnel that is involved in the protection of such uh, heritage and all are codified in this instrument already. Optional Protocol 1, which was adopted the same year, but indeed giving the chance to states to uh, consider ratifying it or not, uh, also regulates important behavior specific to international armed conflicts and situations of occupation. And important to this particular panel discussion today, uh, we do have important rules prohibiting export of cultural property from the occupied territory, as well as obligation to return such property as well. So we will be taking a closer look to this particular instrument. This instrument has very limited uh, relevance to non-international armed conflicts uh, because states uh, have chosen to codify these issues and areas in this manner. Uh, but it's important then to highlight uh, the supplementary nature of the second protocol as well, uh, which was adopted in 1999. Uh, and importantly, that entire instrument applies to all types of armed conflict, including non-international armed conflicts, without distinguishing between the two. So the same rules apply to protection of cultural property in the context of international and non-international armed conflict. Uh, important safeguards also have been updated. Uh, they are much more complete. And the special protection layer that we mentioned earlier has been replaced by enhanced protection, which is even a stronger uh, and much more uh, realistic, uh, so to say, uh, as uh, often affirmed by states protections uh, afforded to a narrow category of cultural heritage, which is of particular significance. Now, other sources, very briefly as well, some of it was mentioned already, 1970 UNESCO Convention related to the uh, uh, prohibition of illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property, Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols that I have mentioned, as well as specific rules of customary law. Now, what are the main rules and prohibitions? Uh, of course, attacks, acts of hostility, reprisals against cultural property, use of explosives um, uh, that cause damage and destruction, uh, exposing such property to particular risks and dangers emanating from armed conflict situations. For example, placing uh, military objectives in the vicinity of immovable cultural property, or moving of movable of, of movable cultural property uh, in the vicinity of military objectives to shield them uh, from attacks or to deter the adversary to carry out attacks against them is a clear example. Theft, pillage, misappropriation, confiscation of such property as well as acts of vandalism. Now, with respect to the distinction between special protection and enhanced protection of cultural property that I have mentioned, as envisaged respectively in optional protocols number one and two, um, special protection uh, is applicable and relevant only in relation to immovable property, including immovable property that is there to safeguard and shield some of the movable cultural property, while enhanced protection does not have such limitation and both movable and immovable property are protected. We have a clearer regime um, of also how uh, cultural property is designated to be uh, eligible for enhanced protection and all of that. Now perhaps central to the discussion uh, that uh, we are having today, um, regarding the non-transfer of property outside of the country of origin and obligation to return such property. Uh, as I mentioned, first optional protocol has very important rules um, and it deals specifically with situations of occupation. By occupation, we mean an exercise of effective control over the territory of another sovereign state by one sovereign state that effectively replaces the authority of the former and at the same time there is no consent from the occupied state uh, to the presence and exercise of effective control by a foreign power. Um, 
rules applicable to such situations highlight uh, that the occupying power has the obligation uh, to safeguard and preserve cultural property that exists in the occupied territory. It also has a clear prohibition of requisitioning of cultural property in occupied territory. There is a positive obligation to prevent any exploitation or exportation of cultural property outside territory and indeed uh, prohibition to retain any cultural property either as uh, a prize of war or for war reparations and there is an obligation to return at the close of hostilities at the very latest any cultural property that has been exported outside of the occupied territory in violation and in breach of the rules that I have just mentioned. There is also an important layer that, which has to do with depositing uh, cultural property, movable cultural property, outside of the country of origin in third states, particularly with the purpose of protecting them from the effects of hostilities. Obviously, this presupposes good faith, uh, and indeed with the ultimate purpose of having that property being returned to the country of origin. Now, we mentioned that in spite of those rules and in spite of very clear prohibitions, uh, violations do nevertheless occur as well. Um, what can we do to change that? Um, it's indeed to ensure that we have the culture with respect and compliance for international law, including international humanitarian law. And there are plenty of guarantees that IHL uh, instruments and customary IHL uh, envisage to make sure uh, that these rules are protected. Measures that have to be taken already during peacetime is particularly important, uh, and it's important to every single country in the world to take all necessary legislative, administrative, and practical measures to make sure that the enabling legislation is in place, to make sure that there are competent authorities designated who have responsibility of giving effect to international treaties, including those that are protecting cultural heritage, as well as, for example, marking of cultural heritage sites, which we have uh, a sign identified under the Hague Convention, which is a blue shield, uh, as well as dissemination and knowledge uh, and information among the civilian and military personnel so that the rules are known and that thereby they can be respected even when armed conflict breaks out. Typically, when armed conflict starts, it's uh, one minute too late to start putting in place those structures. So this is why ICRC also has been working very closely with the uh, states in its role to advisory on international humanitarian law, um, as ICRC has been mandated by states to do so. Important to practical measures that have to be taken during the already peacetime as well has to do also with some of the safeguards to ensure compliance with international law. And of course, when it comes to responsibility for IHL violations, we do have state responsibility and individual responsibility, which are complementary and not mutually exclusive. And when it comes to specifically about individual criminal responsibility, we do have the duty to criminalize certain behavior that has to do with a violation of rules on the protection of cultural property. Before concluding, uh, I would like to, um, let's say, mention about one initiative that the ICRC has taken to, in a way, attempt and confront the narrative that international humanitarian law is always violated and there are no uh, instances where the role of law actually has function or delivers the, the results that we would like to see. Indeed, across uh, media, we do see a lot of the violations happening of international humanitarian law. Sometimes these are blatant violations. And perhaps we don't celebrate enough also instances where the law has functioned. And it's true that by nature, violations do importantly attract attention, and they should. Uh, but this particular initiative, IHL in Action, uh, Respect for the Law on the Battlefield, is an initiative of the ICRC that must date back to five years. And this is indeed something that is very close to academia as well. Uh, the ICRC has carried out this project in partnership with different law clinics across the globe. Uh, and in this uh, law clinic, students have identified specific cases uh, where law has been respected. 
And I think it's a very interesting and important tool uh, that highlights also examples of compliance with the law and what positive impact that can have. Now, of course, ICRC with its neutrality, meaning that ICRC does not publicly pronounce about violations or instances of necessarily celebrating uh, instances of respect for IHL, uh, ICRC publishes this uh, particular da database with the disclaimer that this should not be construed as such as a condemnation or indeed the acknowledgement of the example of respect for IHL. So this is the result of law clinics but we do find some of the uh, cases are particularly interesting. I have included QR codes there so that in case you want to scan it and go and land on the particular case uh, features in the database, you can do so and you can uh, engage with the discussion at the end of this case study. But I wanted to bring this example of Jordan and Iraq, whereby Jordan has transferred back cultural property, movable cultural property that has been exported from the territory of Iraq uh, illegally. Uh, they have put in place all the measures and structures designated authorities, collected all the cultural property and more than uh, tens of thousands of artifacts have been returned to Iraq and those are now uh, presented indeed in some of the museums of Iraq. This was done under uh, the international cooperation and assistance that is indeed affirmed in the first optional protocol to the Cultural Heritage Convention. And the second example that I wanted to bring is indeed something uh, that relates to practical and legislative measures that I have mentioned to give effect to international humanitarian law treaties. And this is the example from the Netherlands, where Netherlands has adopted enabling legislation for the first optional protocol to indeed give effect to judicial proceedings that ultimately resulted in returning cultural property back to Cyprus, where it has been illegally exported during the occupation of the part of Cyprus uh, in the 70s. So I leave you with these two cases, uh, and I very much look forward to discussion that will follow, and I thank you for your attention. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. George, for your very insightful uh, presentation. And we learned a lot about the uh, IHL uh, rules on the protection of uh, cultural property uh, during the armed conflict. Uh, and also, I think, uh, last you mentioned about the industrial corporations and, and assistance is very important, and the role of ICSC in the case of uh, return of uh, cultural property from, from Jordan to Iraq. It's very interesting. So thank you very much. We will go back to Dr. George. Uh, after we will finish all the presentation, we can uh, ask some questions or comments. So now I'd like to invite our second uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Sinuas Bora from uh, South Asian University. Dr. Sinuas will speak on the topic, uh, protection of uh, intangible Cultural property, please, uh, Dr. Serena, please. 15 to 20 minutes, please. Thank you, Excellency. I uh, thank all of those are too early in the morning at 9.30 to be here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my topic is uh, protection of intangible cultural property, uh, which, is, which, which is something substantially different from the other four other, four other presentations which are part of the panel, which specifically focus on uh, tangible cultural heritage. But my focus is going to be on intangible cultural heritage, uh, which in fact is part of international law for longer period to be regulated as part of an international treaty. Uh, uh, my presentation, which I broadly divided into four parts. One is a broad background to the international legal regulation of intangible cultural property. Second is the, the legal framework, the existing legal framework, and how it deals with the protection of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, third part is that the specific aspects 
uh, particularly the lists which are part of the legal framework, that is 2003 convention, and the fourth part is uh, the critical appraisal of the existing legal framework on intangible cultural heritage. Now, if you look at the protection of cultural property as part of international law, for various reasons, I think the focus has been, historically for the last 70 or 8 years, has been on tangible cultural heritage. That is the reason why you see all the four presentations other than mine focus on ta tangible part of the cultural property. Probably there are some historical reasons for this. One is, of course, the first legal regulation took place post Second World War, specifically dealing with protection of cultural property, which George talked about. Uh, during the armed conflict situations. Now, the focus of this uh, convention was essentially the uh, tangible cultural property, that is, monumental material objects and material spaces. Now, what could have been the reason? Probably that was the specific target during the Second World War, and which continues to be the case in most of the armed conflict situations, where the focus is generally, especially the, the parties to the armed conflict, right, to focus the attack on specifically the tangible cultural objects. Uh, of the opponents. Now, that could have been one of the reasons why the legal focus or international uh, lawmaking process as part of international law might have focused on the tangible part of the cultural property. But interestingly, that continued even after that, till 2000, because if you see the net later development, that is the most important development was of 1972, World uh, Heritage Convention of 1970, that specifically focused on the tangible part of the cultural property, followed by Underwater cultural pro protection of underwater cultural property, then with regard to the stolen property, all of them focus on the tangible part of it. Now, all in all, it is not that intangible cultural property was not the focus of the efforts by states. Some states were uncomfortable with this, particularly states from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. They were concerned that I think the entire focus of the international legal framework on the cultural property protection has been tangible part of it. For various reasons, that is the Europe is the center for that. And that is what is reflected very clearly in the second post-Second World War also. So many of them have been asking that I think there has to be an effort for the purpose of protection of intangible cultural heritage. If you, if you look at the list of the world heritage list, I think it is in balance, it is predominantly. Now probably I think the non-European cultural objects, I mean, the monuments and the material objects are more in the list, but it is 10 years ago, it is predominantly the European concentration of the, the list which is prepared as part of the 1972 convention. So they were concerned that our focus, our, our in cultural property has been historically intangible in nature, where the people carry, it's not something that a monumental or a material object, but it is more of a living culture which needs to be protected. Now that, is, that has been the concern of most of Latin American, African, and Asian states, uh, and they brought this up uh, at various forums. But the focus has always been in terms of looking at intellectual property rather than as a general protection of cultural property. So therefore, they have in terms of the traditional knowledge and folklore, which has been the subject matter in WIPO, even prior to that, even in 1950s also, the focus always has been in terms of intellectual property. There. So there was never an effort seriously to to look into as a, as a general protection of intangible cultural heritage. But that changed for various reasons because of the consistent effort by certain states, particularly coming from broadly global south. So there's a clear divide with regard to cultural property also with, uh, with regard to uh, in terms of global south and global north distinction uh, in, in the legal framework. Uh, because of the various uh, efforts by these states, from 90s onwards, uh, th there has been an effort to further purpose of making intangible cultural heritage as part of the protection framework of international law. So before going to that, there was a 1989 declaration uh, by the UNESCO, followed by 1993, there is a list which was prepared uh, as part of the UNESCO, UNESCO effort, which are finally leading to the 2003 convention, that is the uh, uh, convention for the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage of 2003. Okay, the, the specific aspect of this convention, of course, it, one can have problems with regard to, I'll come to that part of it in terms of critical evaluation part of it. But the most important part is that the definition provided by the uh, convention, it specifically talks about uh, the definition of intangible cultural heritage. It says that it means the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, cultural spaces associated there. Now, this definition has three components. One is that 
it is practices, representations, expressions and knowledge, which is more in terms of the living part of it, but that is also closely related, as well as the instruments and objects, artifacts and artifacts. So that is instruments part, of it, which again is the, an element of tangible comes into the intangible part. One is the intangible is in terms of the expression of practices, but the tangible part of the intangible is the uh, objects, artifacts and uh, instruments. Now the third part of it is, comes in the form of the spaces asso associated with it. Now the spaces part is a stable, again it is something similar to tangible, but it is more fluid, not like some, something called an artifact. So what we look at as intangible cultural heritage today also contains certain elements of a tangible part of it. But the predominant focus is with regard to the intangible part of it, which is basically it's an everyday life of the people. So therefore, it further goes and it says this intangible cultural heritage transmitted from generation to generation is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment. So it's nothing something called a stable one. It doesn't remain as a stable one, intangible cultural heritage. It keeps changing it because it has to be passed from one generation to the other. So there is nothing like a monument which needs to be protected. There is nothing like a material object which needs to be protected. But the form itself needs to be protected when it moves from one generation to the other. See, in other words, you will have to really protect in terms of the performance performed by individuals or lived through by individuals, groups and communities. So that, and very specifically it talks about the communities, groups and individuals. So it is not like something called a state, but the, the, the cultural object, that is the intangible cultural form is essentially in the communities, groups and in the, the other important part of the definition is that uh, it is manifested in, in various forms. Like the, the, the form gets manifested in various forms. So that is also listed in specific form. The five components through which it is transmitted. One is that oral traditions and expressions, performing acts, social practices, rituals and festive events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe and traditional craftsmanship. So these are the five components through which the intangible cultural heritage or intangible cultural forms are expressed. So there is one is the definition part of it, specifically defines it and also through what form these cultural practices are expressed is also identified by the convention. So in that sense it is very important that the convention provides a definition part because why this definition is important is that Prior to 2003, though there was an effort with regard to the or regulation of intangible cultural heritage, but it was essentially as part of the IPR framework, intellectual property rights, traditional knowledge and folklore. So therefore, in terms of defining what constitutes intangible cultural heritage for the purpose of general protection, this definition becomes an important one. Obviously, there are certain issues with regard to that, but at least it is an important one that the convention defined what constitutes an intangible cultural heritage. The another important part of the convention, apart from the definition, is that of course it has its own mechanism, the confidence of the parties, means the general assembly of the parties, and there is a specific committee, which is the committee is an intergovernmental committee. But the important task of this committee is that it has to identify certain cultural, intangible cultural forms applied by states to put it as part of the list. So there are two lists which are provided, main two lists. One is the representative list, the other is those cultural forms which need urgent protection, which means that with the threat to those cultural forms, they need to be protected as a separate list. And the second list is with regard to the representative nature of the intangible cultural form. So the purpose of this committee is basically the state parties who make application to the committee every year and based on the value of that intangible cultural heritage, they are included either as part of the representative list or as part of the or as part of the uh, uh, intangible cultural heritage under threat. So there are two lists. But predominantly, if you see the current list, most of the most of the intangible cultural heritage forms, as applied by states, are part of the representative list rather than the cultural forms which are under threat. Because more and more applications are coming from states for the purpose of keeping them as part of the list itself. Now that is the second important part of uh, the uh, legal framework that is the 2003 uh, convention. But the, the impo another important role for the committee is also that from time to time it also formulates operational directives. So in other words it formulates certain kind of rules for the purpose of listing and for other purposes. Also. 
In other words, the committee really holds an important function and from 2003 onwards, because the convention came into force in 2006, and there is a good number of states, more than 180 states are part of, uh, parties to the convention. So it is a, the states are becoming more and more in number as part of the convention. So therefore, these operational directives play very significant role which are formulated by the committee from time to time. So that's the second uh, part of it. Uh, let me, without getting into the more details of the convention, but if we have to critically evaluate uh, the convention, 2003 convention, the purpose for which it has come into existence and how it is performing over a period of time. The first part is that the distinction between tangible and intangible culture. So in the beginning I said that the, the uh, major part of international law regulation has been tangible cultural heritage. So therefore, to some extent, intangible cultural heritage has not attracted the required attention till 2003. But the other fundamental question that arises is whether we, we can really make that kind of a distinction between tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Yes, it is very difficult to for, make a clear distinction between tangible and intangible heritage. Of course, we will be able to identify what constitutes tangible cultural heritage. For example, Red Fort, it is a tangible cultural heritage. Uh, whether it has certain intangible cultural elements to it, yes, in a, in a bit of a philosophical sense, probably it does have certain things. Like when you say a Red Fort, if nobody knows about the history of Red Fort, it is a normal construction. It doesn't have anything. It is just it's a building, something. But unless, unless you know something about a historical part of it in terms of your ideas, which is an intangible in the sense that the tangible cultural heritage does not have much of a value. And same is the case with what we focus as an intangible element also has certain tangible elements in the sense that like uh, 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 instrument, artifacts, which are in fact are used as part of it and the place where it is performed, the particular cultural performance also has a distinction. So therefore, it has, there has been a debate that whether we can make a clear distinction between tangible and intangible. But at least there are certain elements where specific focus is on tangible part of it and the predominant part of the intangible part is there. Now that is one to some extent it has been resolved with the adoption of the 2000. Because till 2003 there used to be that kind of a debate that okay for the purpose of general protection we don't need to focus much on intangible cultural heritage. We can focus more from the point of view of intellectual property rights on intangible part of it and focus more on the general protection on the tangible part. But that, to a large extent, has been dissolved with the adoption of the 2003 convention. That is one part which one has to be careful while making this distinction. There is no, we will not be able to easily make, in all circumstances, a clear distinction between tangible and intangible. There is always a kind of an overlapping aspect involved. That is one part. Uh, uh, the second aspect is that, uh, from outstanding to representative, in the sense that if you look at the preparation list, uh, especially for the 1972 convention, it, it also has this. So therefore you see that many from different countries, uh, the monuments and spaces are listed as part of the world heritage under the UNESCO 1972 convention. But in, uh, one important part of the 1972 convention's preparation is that it specifically focuses on outstanding universal value. Means that it would be evaluated. It's not that in a random way every monument or a construction is can become part of the list of under 72 countries. It's not possible because it would be evaluated, it should have an outstanding universal value. But when it comes to intangible cultural heritage, no such requirement is necessary in the sense that it doesn't need to meet the requirements or any threshold. It is only a representative list part. Of it. So states can make representations because the idea was that when it comes to intangible cultural heritage, we should not hierarchize because you cannot say that okay, this is a very good outstanding universal value but others do not have because it, it does bring in a uh, certain element of hierarchy and this hierarchy is more problematic because it is it closely related to the com living communities, groups and individuals. It has, it, it leads to certain com element of discrimination. Therefore, there is no such thing called an outstanding. That is a positive part of the convention. The other is that uh, in the beginning itself, in the, in the definition itself, it very specifically talks, talks about the protection of intangible cultural heritage should be in compliance with, I mean, it should be compatible with human rights instruments. So in other words, it says that, that if a protection has to happen of a particular intangible cultural heritage, it has to comply with the existing human rights framework. 
Now, which, in other words, means you are prioritizing the existing human rights freedom. Now, what is the need for the prioritization of human rights over the protection of cultural property? Now, there is one danger with intangible cultural heritage, uh, which is different from tangible cultural heritage, is that uh, almost or most of the tangible cultural heritage also reflects certain kind of probably oppression, colonialism, or power relations. Because most of the monuments are reflections of that. Most of those things which in fact you see as the protected ones in India also are colonial constructions. Now if you go get into the history part of it, then it is always something, some, some historical injustice. In some form or the other is embedded into most of the tangible, monumental, material constructions. But people don't have much of a problem. Now one way of looking at it is that of course the debate with regard to uh, road should must fall. That was the debate in South Africa. But we can't say that with every cultural property which is a oppressive a symbol of injustice should go, should fall. We don't say that. There are two explanations. One is of course you distance yourself in the sense that it does not interfere with your day-to-day -day life of it. It remains as a historical memory and a part of the history. So therefore most of the cultural objects, that is monumental objects, even if they reflect some um, certain element of hierarchy and injustice and oppression, but it does not interfere with your day-to-day -day life part. But when it comes to intangible cultural property, that's not the case. Now, somebody is practicing something, that means somebody is automatically discriminating me or somebody or for somebody for some reason. I'll come to the concrete example quickly to that. So therefore, it has to comply with the human rights framework, particularly in matters like race, particularly in matters of gender, in South Asian context, caste. So there are several hierarchies which exist, which are the subject matter of human rights. Therefore, any form of intangible cultural heritage should comply with the human rights obligations. So now that is, and it's a very tricky thing, it's not an easy part of it. Well, like for example, many of the cultural, intangible cultural forms, which in fact are part of the list now, are problematic from the point of view of gender. Because specifically under CEDA, the convention asks the state parties to interfere, enter into the cultural factors which have discrimination element in view. So that means that the states have an obligation to not I mean, correct those cultural practices where it is gender discriminated. So therefore, there are many cultural practices which are intangible, would have implications for gender. So therefore, this is an important one, but it has not been fully addressed if you look at the list of them. The last point that I'd like to focus on is that whether when we make this protection as an intangible cultural uh, property, is it something that we always give priority to the mainstream cultural forms at the cost of subordinate cultural forms? In the sense that, like, what becomes part of the list in the representative list of the, the 2003 convention is not necessarily reflective of those cultural practices which really need protection, which, because most of the times mainstream always have a space. But the, 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 which are part of the periphery or which are not part of the mainstream, predominantly performed by subaltern castes and groups and classes, would not get sufficient protection in a normal sense. But when a state makes a representation to an international legal framework like the list, predominantly even the state framework is also dominated by the mainstream. So whether the convention has any framework to, to really address that problem, the convention really does not have, because it's states which do that. Now, as a result of that, if you look at the list which is which is which has been there for the last 10 years or 15 years now, you can say it gets reflected where, for, for various reasons, I think the mainstream forms of uh, intangible cultural heritage do get priority over, over intangible cultural forms. Now, how do we establish it? Now, I cannot speak about 140 other countries because there are 676. Uh, elements which are listed as part of this uh, representative list from 140 countries. So I have not done the com empirical part of the study, but I can speak about India. Now, what are the cultural objects that are part of this list from India? So I know that started from 2008 onwards till now. Now, looking at it, the, the kind of cultural forms that are, that are nominated by India and which have become part of the, the representative list of the 2003 convention, there are 40 elements which are part of it. Now, if you look at it, uh, it started with Kudiyatam in 2008, then Ramlila, then Vedic Chanting, and the latest one is of 2021, 
दुर्गा पूजा इन कोलकाता फॉलो पे कुंभ मेला इन कुतन सेवेंटीन योगा संगीतना बुद्ध सेंटिंग लता तो आउट ऑफ़ फोर्टीन आई मीन कुछ वन कैन हैव अ डिबेट इन टू इट मोस्ट ऑफ़ देम आर रियली रिफ्लेक्टिव ऑफ़ द मेनस्ट्रीम कल्चर ऑफ़ इंडिया नाउ इट कुड बी कास्ट पॉइंट ऑफ़ यू अ क्लास पॉइंट ऑफ़ यू डोमिनेंट सोशल ग्रुप्स पॉइंट ऑफ़ यू व्हिच इज़ द मेनस्ट्रीम कल्चर व्हिच इज़ लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल राम नाउ देर आर डिफरेंट वर्जन्स ऑफ़ राम आंजम्स Each one of them do not really reflect the cultural diversity of India, especially those cultural forms which, in fact, are performed and, and uh, protected by those indigenous communities, tribal communities, and so on. So, therefore, this is one major issue. At least looking at the 14, probably that would be the case with most of the countries because I have not done that empirical study. I cannot speak about that. But at least from the Indian point of view, look at it. I think the convention somewhere, somewhere does not have the framework to really identify those cultural forms which in fact are part of the larger cultural and environmental diversity. And that is another major drawback with the convention. Uh, okay, I'll stop there. Maybe if there are any other uh, questions and comments, we can. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sirvinas, for your uh, very insightful presentation. And we learned a lot about the protection of uh, intangible cultural property, one of very uh, interesting topic. So you bring us to the issue of uh, the legal background of the topic, legal frameworks, and some uh, specific aspect, and then uh, discuss about the uh, critical issues. And myself, I wonder, because in, in our goal at the, our organization, we have the topic on the folklore and expression of folklore and protection is uh, related to the issue of the IPR, intellectual property regimes. Quite interesting, we, we can talk about it later. Thank you very much, Dr. Srivinath. So now we turn to the third uh, panelist, uh, Professor Rashmi from uh, VAPS. Uh, uh, Professor Rashmi will speak on evolving international legal regimes on returns of uh, cultural property. Please, Dr. Rashmi. Or like you know, uh, the coins encrypted. 
connected those uh, kind of stuff which are there so everything is related to the identification of a particular civilization and at present the feeling is that that if we will be able to preserve it then even our future generation will also be able to cherish that particular identity so it is all about it is all about the preservation of our cultural identity now when we are saying that is cultural identity here in in all the conventions i have seen that they have used the word that is the cultural property it is not about uh, a kind of you know national property now why i am saying like this because many a times the culture the cultural property and your nationalism that your national pride somehow we you know we take it as it is we take it as a synonyms for example like uh, my earlier speaker professor gulaki has given an example of like great coat for that matter some of those uh, you know intangible property kind of uh, yes like durga puja and etc so you will find that we will take it as an identity of india rather than a cultural property but however to respect of right or to, to respect the right to culture of each and every group of each and every individual uh, maybe in all these conventions they have used the term that is the cultural property now when we are taking back our own property from other countries like you will find you know examples from australia we got from us we got at times the uh, you know the delegations they are going to other countries they are also getting it it is not something that they are getting back their national property but they are getting back cultural property anyway so uh, this what is the word they have used that is the cultural property the international legal, uh, legal regime which i have understood on cultural property we can say that there is a legal regime on the protection of cultural property mainly during arm conflict internal and international both then <coughs> preservation of cultural property and then return of cultural property so i will focus more on return of cultural property i will skip this particular slide regarding protection of cultural property because uh, dr josh he has covered almost all the points now i will come on the return of cultural property so mainly there is uh, there are two conventions two of them they are of unesco one is of 1970 another is of 2001 but i have uh, covered mainly of 1970 then there is uh, unicod convention of 1995 and then i believe that we are required to understand international law horizontally rather than only vertically so therefore i have uh, given article 20 of that 1994 as well so now starting with Return of cultural property. This particular convention by UNESCO. This is what is convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. 1970. So you will find it has a long name, and in all this particular title depicts that what exactly it is there in this particular convention. If you will see the background, it is all about like after Second World War, many states they were getting independence. and young nations they wanted to curb the illicit trafficking of cultural property so therefore if you will see the preamble uh, you know all the provisions if you will not be exhaustive document hardly 26 provisions articles you will find in this particular convention but however preamble is more is about you know moral obligations of the state parties but the provisions are somehow more loud in comparison to the preamble so the preamble it says mainly to protect the cultural property from the dangers of theft clandestine excavation and illicit export and also to enhance the cooperation between international and national bodies to protect cultural property india is also party of this particular convention here uh, they have given the meaning of cultural property and it is very wide in nature uh, according to me they have covered flora fauna as also property relating to history products of archaeological excavation historic monuments or sites then acquisition of more than 100 years old inscription so this particular 100 years old thing you will find in across all the conventions as also in our indian position also you will find that we have we are depending on this particular 100 years old uh, thing like inscriptions coins then engraved these objects of ethnological interest property of artistic interest rare manuscripts old books postage revenue etc stamps then archives including sound photographic 
and cinematographic archives, articles of furniture more than 100 years, and also musical instruments. So you will find that almost all uh, the so-called cultural property identification kind of uh, thing, they have been covered in this particular definition. Under Article 4, they have given a definition of cultural heritage also. The main features, I would say that mainly in the article, that is Article 5, 10, and 17, you will find that it is more about capacity building of various aid parties, including educational awareness. Uh, prohibit teenagers by issuing a certificate in this particular provision, you will find in Article 6, what they are saying that uh, you are required to issue a certificate and against that certificate only you can claim it that yes, this is very important or this is my cultural property which is registered in nature also. Article 7, Article 8 is required to be read uh, in detail uh, because Article 7, what it says that, that uh, necessary measures are required to be taken by national leg legislations to prohibit illegal export in the state's concern. And further, Article 8 is saying that penalties or administrative sanctions on persons responsible can be taken under this particular convention. However, uh, as such, penal punishment is not uh, is not explicitly mentioned under this particular uh, provision. So, more or less, it is all about national legislation. Whatever is allowed under national legislation, those states you are allowed to take under this particular convention. Uh, and then further, Article 9 is about control international commerce, control on imports and exports of such material. So this particular uh, aspect has also been covered under 1970 UNESCO Convention. Uh, Article 10 a is about that when you are required to restrict the illicit trafficking by uh, penal or administrative sanctions, so under Article 10 they have covered this particular one. And for that matter, what it says that the registration, means, you know, the record is required to be there. It means that if there is, uh, if there is, for example, any kind of product which you think that yes, it is your cultural uh, property, for that matter, that registration is required, the certificate is required, and then only you can claim. So in a way, we are required to prove it, and then only you can claim. Uh, further, this particular scope of 1970 convention has been expanded under uh, this intergovernmental committee for promoting the return of cultural property. Uh, to its countries of origin or its restitution. So actually this particular committee has been uh, developed in 1978 as a permanent intergovernmental body. And it has, though even though it has been developed under 1970 convention, but it is an independent body. Uh, meaning thereby, the states who are not the party to 1970 convention can also be the members of this particular committee. So thereby, the scope has been expanded with this uh, ICPRCP. Uh, so, in all, in 1970 convention, what we have seen that, yes, there are, uh, like, it is, it is only about the state. It is the choice of the state, actually, uh, also, because Article 7 says that on the request of the state of origin, then only, you know, all the proceedings will start. So, the request is required to be there. For that matter, awareness to that particular state officials is also required that something has been stolen or something has been trafficked illegally from my uh, territory. So thus you will find that there are gaps in asserting on the restitution. It is not so robust in uh, nature and moreover as I have told you, the preambular statement is more, more about moral obligation. So therefore, we will find that uh, United Road Convention which has been adopted in 1994, 24th June 1994, but it came into enforcement in 1995. So this particular convention we find is more robust in comparison to 1970 UNESCO convention. Now the point is that if 1970 UNESCO convention is there, then why there is 1995 convention? So uh, Unicron convention is is about the stolen or illegally exported objects 1995. And here you will find that the main objective is to reduce the illicit trafficking by gradually but profoundly changing the conduct of the actors in the art market and of all the buyers. Uh, here in Article 3 is very important, very, it is stated that it is not, mis like in 1970 convention, it is like as per the request of the state of origin, then the proceedings will start. But however, here it is the, it is the duty of a state who found that some stolen cultural property is there, so even they can also start. So this is Article 3 one. 
which uh, ancients the principle that a possessor of a cultural object that has been stolen must return it whatever the circumstances and other uh, main object uh, features of 1995 uh, convention is that that it must be shown significantly that uh, whatever has been stolen it has been really uh, you know impaired the preservation of scientific information or so or some kind of damage is there so again you know if we will see the form of claiming that particular property may be different in Unicron, but again you are required to prove that uh, you are required to show all the documentation you are required to show that it has been entered in a register like in 1970 also they have mentioned a register you are required to mention you, you are required to you know, record it in some of the registers so that kind of procedures you will find over here uh, in this convention one more thing which is required to be mentioned is that that it does not recognize national export bans issued on political or economic grounds but it requires the evidence of a significant impairment of chiefly cultural but also scientific or historical interest uh, the point which is uh, debatable in this particular convention that is about the payment of compensation now who will pay the compensation in 1970 convention it is stated that <coughs> on the expenses of the state of origin who is claiming that particular property they are required to pay and then uh, they are required to take that particular property however unicron convention it is stated that it is uh, like they have imposed the individual responsibility on a person who has stored that particular property and then that particular person is required to pay for that matter however again they have used unicron uh, convention 1995 they have used the term that is reasonable efforts uh, reasonable efforts are required to be done wherein that individual is required to pay uh, for that particular uh, stolen property uh, so it, it matters because at times do not know whether they will be having that kind of you know position to pay or not but then uh, payment of compensation mainly by one responsible for the stolen property and for that reasonable efforts are required to be done now coming on the next point which i wanted to cover under here that is of that 1994 article 20. now here if you will see article 20 is general exception Straight away we can go on its F provision that is imposed for the protection of national treasures of artistic, historic or archaeological value. Now as I told you that we are required to read this according to me, we are required to read international law or in as well rather than only on the vertical. You are aware that in that 1994 there are uh, or in fact under WTO there are covered agreements and there are referred agreements which are covered under covered agreements or which are referred under cover documents. These are the main two sources. Uh, like for earth trips also you will find that many WIPO conventions have been referred. Now here, however, uh, as far as my research goes, they have not, they have not referred 1970 convention. 1995 Unicron convention, okay, it is very new uh, because WTO came into existence in 1994 for that matter. But then even 1970 convention has also not been referred even though this particular F provision is there wherein they have given an exception pertaining to the protection of national treasures of artistic, historic or archaeological value. Now here I wanted to bring uh, into your kind attention that if you will be able to recollect the definition which I have read of article 1 given under 1970 convention, they have covered flora and fauna also. Now in that case under article 20 there is B provision also which protects the human life, plant and etc. So plant is there. But then again also you will find that there is no connection between these two things. So why we are giving exception under article 20? It is to protect, right? That is what is our, uh, that is what is our objective. Uh, we are, we wanted to make it separate from trade and commerce or for that matter to earn profit for that matter. But however that particular thing has not been covered completely under that 1994 article 20. There are few resolutions also which have been passed by General Assembly pertaining to the cultural property. Uh, recently, 2021, unanimously they have adopted this particular General Assembly resolution on return or restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin. Security Council resolution is also there, that is of 2017, and wherein they have encouraged member states to propose listings. Uh, it is mainly about against the terrorist activities and they have condemned their activities wherein they are targeting the cultural property. Uh, now what is the Indian position? Indian position, one of our fundamental duty 
that is Article 51 AF again to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture. We are having an act also, Antiquities and Art Treasures Act 1972. This particular act is expected to be very robust. Why? Because in 1970 convention for which we are a party, it says that as per your national legislation, you are required to take the steps. Then further, uh, the process in India is that we are having Ministry of Culture wherein uh, 3,650 monuments uh, have been designated as uh, national heritage. Then further, Directorate of State Archaeology and Museums is responsible to upkeep the monuments. Uh, many municipalities, they have also made city list of heritage and artifacts. And then they are required to uh, look into the matter with all coordination. Now here, the coordination is very much required. For example, in Unicrot 1995 convention, it is stated that before three years you are required to claim that this particular stolen property which is in your country is belonging to me. Before three years. Now, if you will see, as Professor Guru also referred in his, uh, uh, you know, uh, speech, that there are few things which are not in the not aware about. There are various, maybe you know, some temples of travels or something, uh, something like that, where someone has created something, but it has been stolen. Uh, it has been illegally trafficked, but however, whether that particular complaint has been reached at the diplomat level or uh, level or not, wherein you can claim. So therefore, coordination is very much required. So the serious approach is required to be started from the ground level to the uh, topmost level officials. Then only you will be able to claim. However, in the list of the Nitrod 1995 Convention, I have not seen the list. Uh, I have not seen the name of the India that it is a party. But if we are thinking then in that case, coordination is required. One exception is also there for that three years limitation is that if it is known that it is belonging to that particular country, then in that case, that three years limitation is not applicable. Now coming on the critical uh, analysis, that is the last point and I will stop. This is what is like right to culture. If we will take it as a sacred right to culture, you will find that it is an ICACR. We all are aware that what kind of binding obligation we have uh, of ICACR in comparison to ICCPR and other conventions like genocide etc. Right to property, it is only in uh, UDHR under Article 17. We will not find its mention in ICCPR and ICACR, right? But however, as the cultural property is closely associated with the identity of a group of people and their existence, therefore we have a legal mechanism which is binding in nature. Now, if it is so, then in that case, like in genocide, when we define genocide, what we say that systematic attack against a particular group of people, race, caste, etc., etc., a particular group of people, which gives identity to that particular group of people and identity uh, and or community. Now, if we are if we are taking cultural property, that property which is giving an identity of your own civilization or so. And also we are coming under genocide wherein we are extending protection to a group of people, then why not to extend the same protection to the cultural property? Right? So even without killing people by just deleting cultural monuments of that particular community also, is it not something that we will commit the same, you know, act that is profit clear? Uh, I know that I'm thinking loud, but this is what is what I think. Then secondly, under Article 1, as I told you, UNESCO, 1970, flora, fauna, etc. has been given. So this particular point I have covered. That, that 1994 is also, uh, is also insufficient. Actually, it has not given attention to cover UNESCO 1970 also under its uh, thing, or under its uh, coverage, even under the, uh, even under its, uh, you know, protection also. Now, suggestion, what I, I wanted to say that when we are, emphasizing on responsibility to protect uh, seriously by the international community, then why not? Responsibility to return the cultural property should also be taken seriously by the international community. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rashmi, for your in-depth uh, uh, information and bring us to the many article of the uh, initial legal instruments on, on protection and preservation of uh, a cultural property uh, as a UNESCO or Judicial Convention and also get, uh, I just learned get 1994 have some provision on, on the uh, protection of uh, 
a control property. So now we turn to uh, another uh, panelist, Dr. Vinay Kumar Singh, who will speak on uh, current and challenge on return of uh, cultural property. Please, uh, Dr. Vinay, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the topic I present is the student challenge to the return of the cultural property. Let me to propose what I'm going to argue is that return of cultural property, this is obligation of return of cultural property, is a customary obligation under But why I am attempting to put this notion, despite that we have a lot of people, why it has become relevant to argue that, propose that, that Return of the cultural obligations is the customer. So my thought has been made easy because the earlier presenter had uh, explained various aspects related to being a customer. Briefly, let me tell you there are several conventions. Just to uh, let you know that uh, these all conventions talk about the return of the stolen cultural property or return of the cultural property. Is legally due. There is a 1954 a convention which Dr. George has detailed explanation and it was being applicable in the, during the armed conflict. And uh, the, there is a specific provision for the return to cultural property. Then we have a 1970 UNESCO convention on the means of privating and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of culture. With this, there are two additional protocols or two protocols attached to it, that is uh, protocol 1 and protocol 2. Protocol 2 is specifically being dealt about return and but with this, there is a already Dr. Rasmi has spoken about a establishment of intergovernmental committee for the promotion of the cultural uh, property, which is being, uh, what you can say, important point we see to which that return could be facilitated. I will come later, what is the problem in this, so far functioning of this intergovernmental committee. Then there is a World Heritage Convention 1977. Then 1983 Vienna Convention on Succession of States in respect of state for property archives and death, 1983 Convention. Then we refer about 1995 Unidra Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects, which Dr. Rasmi has spoken and led. Then 2003 UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, 2003 UNESCO Convention, briefly. It has been discussed by Dr. Sri. And there are the 2005 UNESCO Convention on Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Culture. And recently, there is a one convention has been adopted, is known as the Nicosia Convention 2022, within the ambit of Council of uh, India is party to all of the convention except that Unidroa uh, Convention and Nicosia. The, if you look this all treaty, it is being, uh, it has basically focused to increase the ambit and scope of the protection of the culture. One aspect. Then also it tries to define the terms of cultural property heritage to extend the application of the over the years through these all of them. Then important element in this convention is the pro pro provision related to return of cultural property. One important aspect which you also find in all treaties is institutional cooperation. Then one which is greatest solution could be seen of Hindu Convention that could be recognition violation as a transnational criminal law. So briefly this all convention over the year expanded the ambit uh, pertaining to the protection of the culture. Now this subject has become more popular recently after what you can say that President Terminal Macron has made a statement and also commissioned it, where he has uh, said that the return of cultural artifacts of African culture 
African country obtained without consent during European colonization will be looked into. And this report has been widely appreciated by Asian African students. The issue is also going to arouse about wholesale return of the cultural property could be a challenge in time. Then uh, there are during the same time, 2019, there is a publication came from the Geoffrey Robertson. This is a beautiful article which title says, Who Owns History? And also recently, if you see a uh, G20 meet, where you find that Prime Minister Narendra Modi also has spoken about uh, in the Banaras Bal, uh, this G20 on cultural uh, aspects. And he also argues for the return of the country. Now, in all these conventions, the important point for all of us to reflect is that these all conventions are non-retractive, neutrophective application in the terms of the application of the convention. It means that these conventions will not apply retrospectively. Like that, what we can see is the provision like 1970 convention, if you read it, it says that its obligation to return a stolen or illegally exported cultural property can only be enforced with regards to objects imported after the entry into the country. This similar uh, aspects you could see into the since 1954. Since 1954, convention is silent on this. It does not talk about retrospect retrospective application of the 1954. It means that it, it talks about that return of the cultural property during armed conflict. That, that aspect always relates with the, what you can say, Asian African colonization and debate from where they are started. Now, so 1954 convention is silent on this part. Uh, often it is been said that Article 28 of the Vienna Convention could be possible to refer it and Article 28 of the Vienna Convention says that treaty generally has to be read and interpreted in prospective application. It cannot be applied retrospectively. So 1954 Convention is not going to help with related to issues, artifacts or monuments, uh, what you can say stolen or illegally exported to claim for the return of them. So, what is going to be challenged for all of us that these convention is not applicable to property looted during the colonial. So, 1954 convention is not going to help us. Similar you would find in Unilever convention which I already told about that the convention will not apply retrospectively. All other conventions are similar can be seen. Now, in this perspective, if you see, only possible methods which could be for the lead lawyer could look into it to claim that what the Asian African demand can be seen in that context. That the return of the cultural property is the customary obligation to the law and for this we need to only refer these all conventions to highlight that these are being present in the normative framework since long time, since 1954. Now, besides that, as I already said that there is an intergovernmental committee uh, for the promotion of the return of the cultural property in 1978, which has been there. If you someone examines this functioning of it, it just it, it recently has come up some solutions related to establishment of mediation and arbitration to deal with this. And they have issued a what you can say some certain rules related to that. But still this committee could not able to resolve many, many of them. Only few issues have so far been dealt by this government. Now, besides that, another challenge you could see is that uh, most of these uh, 
artifact monument which is being stolen is in museum, some nation's museum. And like take an example of British Museum. British Museum has an act 1963 which says that trustees are legally bound by judiciary duty to preserve the museum collection and dispose objects only in extremely specific and unusual circumstances. What does it mean that this museum act prohibit, prohibit returning of the cultural property? This was been at length debated in the uh, in the British Parliament, and uh, when this debate about returning of cultural property during the Holocaust, after lot of negotiation and discussion, they have passed 2009 Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act of 2009. Nine. This has basically passed to only avoid that uh, repatriation and uh, return may not be violated to the British Museum Act 1963. But still, if you see literatures appearing from the UK, uh, claims that the uh, British Museum Act would prevail in many of the situations because this is a trustee who would be taken, taken into confidence while passing any resolution for any position. Besides that, as I said, this is the not matters related between states. There could be issues related to also between private persons as well as states. So issues become more complex. Again, the another challenge is that states are holding. If there is more than one state claims the one property, same property, then it also become a matter of like Wohunu, we all know India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all claims. Now it is also important to bring to all state platform and to see. Now the debate what what could be the important context to face is that the, where that uh, which is the thrust for all of us to debate and discuss is that if the cultural property belongs to national importance. That is the first which Rasmi has also indicated to attend. Now, there are two views at international level talking before. One is about talk about nationalist approach and other is internationalist approach. Nationalist approach always talks about the return of the cultural property to the state, which we today are being claiming. Another interest in internationalist in, in approach which is also appearing uh, in the in international law, voting and reading article. That uh, if it's possible that certain, uh, that those who have very well resources could possibly to take care about the, uh, this, uh, what you can say, the cultural problem. So with this, uh, I would end here. Uh, my job was to only to propose my hypothesis and prove that the present situation allows us to argue that the customary obligations return to uh, return of the uh, student property would be the right way to go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vinayat, for raising some uh, challenges uh, regarding the return of cultural properties uh, under the some uh, conventions uh, of uh, UNESCO and UNITWA. So now we turn to the last uh, panelist, uh, Assistant Professor Bhumigananda, uh, will speak on the topic uh, protecting the past for the future, destruction of cultural heritage in conflicts as a violation in the critical of uh, international law. Please, uh, uh, Professor Bhumika, please. Thank you, uh, thank you sir. Greetings to the dignitaries today on the guys and all the guys. Um, I'm taking a broad topic in the sense of a cultural heritage, and therefore it covers most of the things which have been stated here because it's all form part of the culture. But just starting from the like start is that the culture as a cultural right. We see that there was a demarcation between civil and political rights and the cultural, economic and social rights, and therefore the cultural right always falls back as a secondary or sometimes a third category of rights to be granted. And that's where the difference in the obligation is also been seen when we see ICCPR talking about a kind of a, in a mandatory tone of compliance, whereas ICCPR talking about a progressive realization of those things. 
and the same thing could be seen the term in terms of the commitment could be seen when we talk about the unesco uh, conventions which are all noteworthy and praiseworthy and are in fact filling on the normative framework required to protect the cultural properties be tangible intangible or the cultural heritage as a whole the problem comes in the enforcement of these rights as already noted by the previous speaker as well. Uh, noting into that, we can't, even though they are given under separate conventions and there's a normative framework is also different, we know that they can, technically speaking they cannot be just separated because if you need civil and political rights, cultural rights forms part of that. Uh, you cannot just exercise a civil and political right of representation, for example, of speech and expression if you are not able to express your own culture. So they all go hand in hand and has been noted on many of the, uh, you know, the professors and the dignitaries who have worked on the human, excuse me, human rights case. So taking note of that, that it cannot be, even though given under different structures, be implemented separately, need to be a holistic approach. What I try to do that is to look into two of the judgments which have been passed by the International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court with regard to cultural heritage. They are not very recent but they are not very old, just a year or a few years old judgments are there. Also at this point I also see that when you define culture which has not been defined per se in a one uniform format and we have to look into different conventions, it comes out that the culture is not only defined in terms of the physical manifestation in terms of monuments, artifacts, but also in terms of the cultural practices and the value it dissociates or a way of life it actually imparts on the people who are part of that culture or international community as such. So taking that as a base, I go into the recent uh, judgment which was or opinion in fact given in terms of the provisional measures to be issued in the case of Armenia versus Azerbaijan and in that case what the international court of Justice has done that, as has been criticized uh, very rightly to a large extent, is that they have gone beyond the scope of CERD. Um, in terms is that the CERD, if you look at it, does not use the word as heritage. It is using the word only as culture and in very limited sense using the word as cultural property. But when the ICC was giving their opinion for provisional measures, they have gone beyond these two limited contexts and have read that when you have a right to participate in the cultural activities, it not only cover about, uh, uh, you know, it also could be extended with regard to your cultural heritage, which are the monuments there. So if people are being prevented for accessing those menu monuments which belong to their culture, it would also amount to the violation. Why? Because they were trying to link the prohibition in terms of preventing them to, to uh, access the monuments, their religious sites, along with the racial discrimination which has been done. Though the dissenting opinion given by two of the judges, Justice Yusuf and Justice Keith, are also noteworthy, they are trying to see that how the court is able to read racial discrimination into that. The court, the dissenting opinion says that the prohibition or um, the uh, the stopping in terms of access to the cultural site have been done not on the basis of racial discrimination per se, but because the landmines were really laid down and they were not sure where the landmines are, and that's why they had to prevent access to those cultural lines. But the point which has to be addressed here is that why those landmines were being laid down there. They were laid down because they already had a previous uh, animosity between them and the base of the uh, animosity was the racial discrimination and the differences between the two communities. So if you take that as a base, I to a large extent so far as it is talking about access to the cultural property, agree with the judgment which has been given by the International Court of Justice and in that manner would uh, take it as praiseworthy that they have expanded uh, the CERD to the extent of a cultural heritage which recognizes the value of a community as a whole and that's why it would be, should be considered as a good precedent in terms of framing of a customary international law so far as cultural heritage is concerned. Coming to the second opinion in the context of an international court, criminal court where they have decided on al Mahadi case, not very very recent but one of the prominent case which because it took very less time for the court to come to the judgment here due to the admission of the guilt by the accused person. So that is one of the reasons why it was uh, one of the judgment given in a very short frame of time as compared to the cases which are still pending. But in that case, keeping aside my uh, 
criticism of that case for ignoring the other crimes which have been done by the accused person or done under the direction of the accused person. The court in fact have recognized that the person has destroyed under the direction and the command has been, uh, the cultural property has been destroyed and those cultural property are not on the stake of the property. While giving the judgment, the court has looked into the cultural heritage as a whole. They also refer to the UNESCO conventions, no doubt, nine of the properties out of 10 which were destroyed were listed as a heritage site under the UNESCO convention and that was also taken by the court in order to realize and give a decision that yes, there is a destruction of a cultural property under the war crimes as well as the entire cultural heritage. One thing more to note here is that as compared to CERD in fact, the ICC Rome statute also does not talk about heritage per se. The preamble, the first preamble in fact talks about the heritage as a word has been used, but it has been used in the context of a shared heritage of the international community. Then the word culture has been used in the context of crime against humanity when they talk about persecution and to a some extent in the war crimes. But that also they are using those properties which are for the science, education and cultural and not been designated as the uh, property which are added to the or helping in the war uh, in the in the armed conflict. Sorry for the terms. So the, even the ICC rule statute also is a sign so we cannot in fact uh, emphasize only the presence or the non-presence of a particular term in a convention to say that the court does not have an authority or the court has gone beyond their jurisdiction to give a decision. What the court has done is that has recognized culture not merely something which can be saved or protected by merely protecting the monuments, the physical manifestation, but they have gone to in fact analyze and accept that the culture is something which is of adds value to the community and therefore something which belongs to the international community as a whole, right? So these two judgments are that way noteworthy and it actually laid down to establishment of the cultural uh, heritage as a customer international law and therefore the international law commission state responsibility articles can be in a way used to emphasize that the state collectively, even though it does not belong, the culture or the property was not in their state when it was destroyed, but they can collectively take action against the state who has actually ended up destroying the heritage which belongs to the international community as such. So this decision would add into the jurisprudence, I believe, and therefore could be rightly used by the international community as a whole. I'll rest here, I did very briefly, but in case you have any question, Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bumika, for your insightful, uh, critical uh, observation on many issues on the uh, protection of uh, cultural property. So now I think we have uh, around uh, 15 minutes uh, for Q and A and some comments. I'd like to invite the participants, uh, if you like to. Uh, ask or know more from each of our panelists, you are welcome. Yes, please. Do you have some microphone here? Sir. I think I have the audio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me this opportunity. First of all, uh, I very... Uh, please, I, please, sorry. My please. name is Jaya Raj. Yes, you yourself. I am a... You can say that I am a definitely a permanent student of international law. I always learn international law. So in that capacity, I must uh, pay a, a compliment to the entire panel. The entire panel presented a cogent, even though they are individual presentation, I could see the connectivity, the cogency, and then we could understand the totality of the subject matter. So that is, for me, it is quite impressive. So therefore, I pay my respectful compliments to each one of them. But one question I have, now is there any case in which a stolen property, a cultural property, has been found out in some place, in somebody's this thing, but uh, later on, that property was 
not returned for various reasons, including a willful destruction or uh, something that the state or the you know one who is in position was not able to explain that creates suspicion. So, is there any uh, any any way of getting reparation instead of restitution or any penalty under any of the conventions? Because it is all said and done, it is a stolen property. So, what is the other consequences other than just returning? This is just uh, for anybody. Anybody in the panel can. Just Thank you very much for your question. Someone can reply to uh, this question. So, uh, so if you'd like to collect, uh, okay, we, we, can, we can collect uh, two or three if we not forget <laughs> the, the questions. Eh? So please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. My name is Dr. G.V. Rao. Uh, my question here is, uh, I, I was very deeply pained to see the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan being destroyed in full public view. I mean, how, what were the consequences? Was there any uh, legal sanction, any kind of a, a you know, uh, a, a judicial opinion or any such kind of action uh, that was taken uh, in view of the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas? That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your, your question. There's some peace there. So my name is Anil Chaudhary. I'm an assistant professor from Bhutaneshwar, Odisha, sir. Sir, I have two questions, basically. Sir. Sorry for the disturbance. Uh, I had two questions for the panel. Uh, any one of you? Uh, first of all is how do you see the controversy of the Kohinu diamond in respect of its uh, ongoing issue between India and Great Britain? Because if uh, we ask a personal opinion, it's a cultural property of India. Of course, to whom does it belong? It's a big question because the UK government says that the ownership of Kohinu is not clear. Uh, my second question is when it comes to non-state actors, especially in Africa, you might have been seen that in 13 to 14 countries, non-state actors have become very prominent. Uh, in a hypothetical situation, if non-state actors uh, take over power in these countries, uh, can they be held responsible for willful destruction of cultural property, considering the fact that there are groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria, or an Ansar Dine in Mali, or an Al Shabaab in Somalia, and there is a real great danger of these countries falling into mayhem and uh, destruction. What is the international position when it comes to dealing with non-state actors in this regard? Okay, thank you very much for your question. There's any other questions? Yes, please. There, there. Uh, thank you, panel, for the opportunity. First of all, I'd like to address the panel as that amazing session to be a part of. Uh, my question with, uh, is very um, specific to intangible part of the cultural heritage. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask the panel if there is a possibility of a digital technology, an augmented technology that could be an int int uh, intelligence interface with pictures uh, alongside the national importance of the cultural, cultural part of it with, which would also address the minority issue that uh, Honorable Panel had addressed that there are certain communities and certain minorities which might not be addressed. How would that turn out and would there be a possible or a potential recognition in the convention, uh, the conventions that we mentioned? Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. The, any other questions? Yes, uh, please, the lady. Hello everyone, my name is Ayat and I'm a student of international law. My question is very basic that since we talked about that these stolen properties, these cultural properties need to be returned and there is a very clear distinction between the national property and cultural property. How are they ought to be returned when culture is not restricted by the national uh, borders and everything? 
So how are they ought to be returned? And how it is to be determined to which nation they have to be returned, even though it's a cultural property? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think the last one. Uh, right, my name is Arunava. So my question actually stems from Professor Nanda's explanation, then goes to Professor Salpika's explanation, and lastly Professor Bura's explanation. So Professor Nanda sp speaks about Almadi's case, which talks about that there are uh, aspects of cultural heritage which are not just monuments. That being noted, Professor Salp Salpika spoke about how there can be a genocidal intent towards cultural identities, which may not be a monument. And Professor Pura spoke about the tangible aspects of cultural heritage. So in communities where animals are considered as very significant to their culture, if they are being attacked during a, let's say, they become a military objective, do they be considered as cultural heritage in a longer run? So that is something which Almadi does talk about somewhere. And that genocidal intent, for example, if we go back to ICTY, uh, the Bosnians were actually like the Bosnian sheep were killed by the Croats to create an example. So how does that play out? So that is something which was going inside my mind. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we are all five uh, number of questions. So perhaps uh, suddenly I'd like to invite uh, Professor Bubika to react about on the yeah. question. Uh, I think we refer to Professor. Please start. Uh, I think so we go to the last one. Yeah, so That's shall we start because. with Ms. Nanda? Yes, yes, yeah. please. Because he, yes. Uh, question. Yeah. Thank you for your question. It's a good extension of that and maybe we can look into it. Something which I didn't cover during the presentation because maybe I was thinking that I had to finish fast is that what the El Mahadi case has done is that not only gave the damages for the individuals who have suffered as a result of that but also the moral harm and a community harm has been given. So the moral harm even though the, ju uh, the judges in fact the say that the destruction of burials, in fact, which happened as a result of the destruction of Mars, could not be put on to the Al Mahadi, but while giving the reparation, they did take account of that moral harm which is caused to the families of the people where the destruction of burial has been done. So if we are taking that, where they did not recognize burial to be a destruction per se under cultural property, but still gave the reparation for that, um, could be used as an extension maybe to work on your you know, example. So that's where uh, the ICC's judgment has opened up, you know, kind of a Pandora box where these things also can be addressed. So that's what my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since your question addressed to uh, Dr. Bora, I'd like to invite Dr. Bora to react, please. Okay. Uh, there are, I think, two specific uh, comments and questions on the presentation. One is with regard to the digital technology part and intangible cultural heritage. Yes, probably I think when we use digital technology, I think that, that is happening now in terms of really recording things and keeping them, preserving them. That would add to that, but I think that's not the fundamental problem. The technology adds to it how the intangible cultural heritage of a particular community can be preserved in a particular form so that it can be probably without people doing it uh, through technology transfer. Now, that could be one way of doing it. But that is not really the purpose of intangible cultural heritage. The idea is that it has to be transferred or transmitted from one generation to the other through people, through the lived experiences, lived lives. So therefore, the element of technology may be useful, but it would not really replace in the sense of preserving something and coming back to it maybe after 100 years. I think that is not the essence of intangible culture. Probably it could also undergo certain changes, and it has to undergo certain changes. Because that element can come only through human experience, not through the intervention of technology. But it would, it would broadly help in terms of going back to the history and how it was. Probably what were the problematic elements in, in a particular form, like for example, taking round labor, like how it was performed 50 years ago and how it is being done. Now that could be an interesting historical study if one can trace it through, through, by help, through the help of technology. But the core of it is, really transmission from one generation to other through human intervention. So that, I think, yeah, that may be a, a bit of help. 
The other, the last question is with regard to the animals attacked during the armed conflict. Now, I think, as I said in my presentation also, the, 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 the primary focus of international law has been till 2003, including the uh, 1954 convention, is predominantly the tangible element part of it. So the specific aspect of intangible is not directly addressed. Of course, it may be part of it, like when, when you are addressing tangible part of it, Bhumika's uh, to reflect on that with the Al Mahdi case. There is also element of intangible comes in in every tangible, but the focus always has been uh, the tangible destruction of cultural property. So the criminalization part, especially the focus of individual criminal responsibility essentially has been through the understanding of the tangible part of it rather than of intangible part of it. So, so as of now you don't see that directly saying that the attack on intangible cultural property itself amounts to a war crime, which uh, at least is not in the, in the current. It may be addressed in other forms. It may fall in certain aspects of war crime. It may also have certain elements of crimes against humanity probably would have. And also a genocide comes in very close. And in fact, there was an argument uh, when the genocide convention boy was being formulated, which was also part of part of the Israeli national legislation, the cultural el element of genocide, the cultural genocide part, of it, which is not part of the genocide definition as of now. But there was an attempt, and the Israeli legislation was one legislation which they brought in when Eichmann was uh, tried. So, but the cultural element has been removed because it is too problematic. Like that. now, that was what the idea when. The, the genocide definition was drafted as part of the Shortyard Convention. Then the last very quick concept to the non-state actors part of it. Yes, non-state actors or state actors. When you, when you look at the individual criminal responsibility, it applies both in similar fashion. I don't think there is any distinction that the, the individual criminal responsibility is more stringent for state and less for non-state. No, I, it applies equally for both whichever the examples that we have given, if they are accused of committing war. Thank you. Dr. Bora, so let me, let me turn to the first question. I think Dr. Ross may prepare to respond to that. On yes. The, yes. So thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to Dr. Jairaj for complimenting the whole panel. So on behalf of the entire panel, thank you so much for your encouraging words. <clears throat> now, what if the stolen property has not been returned, even though we are aware that, okay, that property is belonging to so-and-so country. So, in all, if we will see the structure, so uh, we can compare it just like in extradition what happened, that whenever we are aware that so-and-so culprit is there and we are having enough documents, so we always claim that you are required to return so-and-so person to us because he is, you know, convicted in so-and-so crime. So this this what what will be the procedure? But the point is here, documentation is a challenge. You are required to prove yourself that you are a state of origin and the property is belonging to you. So that is main challenge. So if we are able to prove it, then thanks to the conventions also and that much of awareness is also there. Like General Assembly, they have adopted resolution in 2021 unanimously that yes, we are required to return the stolen property to the uh, state of origin. So that way there is a consensus, but however, we are required to prove it with the help of documentation and then only we will be able to claim it. Uh, now further, if uh, there are any legal sanctions have been imposed on the, uh, you know, Buddha or so, so therein I would like to say that Security Council Resolution 2017, we can say that wherein Security Council, they condemned the attack done by the ISIS uh, terrorist uh, acts against the cultural uh, property and the monuments. Uh, quickly, I would like to add something about Kohinoor because whenever we say cultural property, the first whatever it comes in our mind is all about Kohinoor. So we are aware that Kohinoor actually this particular uh, you know diamond has been gifted by uh, the then old boy, you know six years old by boy Maharaja Dilip Singh to Queen Victoria, and that documentation is there. So whether means you know he was a minor but then why he was called as a Maharaja or so. So that way there is a debate. So therefore we are not able to claim it. However, individual petitions have also been filed that why Kohinoor is not coming back to India. So this is what is the uh, legal position pertaining to Kohinoor. 
and actually when we study the Indian position, actually we are required to divide it into before uh, uh, you know part uh, before means when Britishers were there and after the independence means before independence and after independence. When East India Company officials were uh, were here, they also used to take some kind of this kind of you know cultural property or so at their personal uh, kind of property also. So they used to take it, but then. Even that time also few acts were there, so I am not able to recollect those years, maybe 1860 or so means two acts were there, wherein earlier they used to take it, then after that it was stated that no, the private officials will not take it, but however it will go to the state, like you know, a Britain they can keep it. So this is how some legal regime was there, but however I am extremely sorry I have not gone into the uh, particular of it, but there is a history regarding the same. So before independence, it is very difficult for us at present to prove it that this is belonging to us because of the uh, mainly because of the lack of documentation. But after independence, that is not the case. And as we are the party of 1970 also convention, so the enforcement of this 1970 convention also it is starting after 1970 means once this particular convention came into enforcement. But still, however, for us it is a bit easy if. Somehow we are able to find out that our property is in some of the country, in some of the museum. Then we can always uh, go through firstly through the uh, diplomatic agents. Uh, mostly we are entering into bilateral treaties or uh, maybe more memorandum of understanding mainly. And thereby we are bringing our uh, cultural property back. So at present this is what is uh, the method which I have found more as per my research. And uh, I think so. All the questions have been uh, responded. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Smith, for your uh, responding uh, proper to quite all the, the question. I, no, I, I think one point is there. I think she has asked one question. Natural and cultural uh, property, right? Uh, what? Ha, yeah. yeah. So yes. what she said that how to identify and how you will decide that okay, this property I am required to get back. So as Vinay sir also told in his presentation uh, very clearly, that is the cultural property of national importance okay so this is how we are identifying that particular property uh, yeah yes so you have raised this point uh, the exact definition if you look at what is being uh, cultural property is being so far defined into several terms i'm trying to place before you cultural property contributes to the fabric of national habitat and emphasize national interest values and pride uh, uh, this is basically the definition you will find in several conventions. And uh, that's why someone need to prove that basically it is connected with your national pride, it is connected with the, your national interest. This has to be proved from the state for that. Uh, definitely that's somehow, somehow some, some very open uh, uh, claim has been made on the basis of national importance. That could be. That's why I said that it could be a. It could be a very complex issue, and it can't be possible to resolve by having certain what you can say uh, one set of definition or one set of the structure to look in. So the, this is this is challenge is being there, and uh, I'm quite sure uh, many literatures are appearing, and gradually some 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 uh, what you can say some more clarity will come on this. Issue. Okay, thank you very uh, much. I think we we have the last. Yes, sir, please, sir. We, we exceed the time already. I think we have the last question from uh, Dr. Narendra Singh, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a short comment. Uh, Mr. Vinay Singh mentioned the British legislation which prohibits the return of cultural property to the countries of origin. Now, the rationale given for this uh, legislation was that the countries of origin would be unable to protect these art objects if they were returned to them and so they would be lost to humanity forever. Now recently there has been a development. It was found that a very large number of cultural objects were stolen from the British Museum. And one British member of parliament has now raised the issue that if your rationale was that you are protecting them and sending them back would result in their loss how do you now continue to justify this argument? And why not start returning it? <laughs> A second uh, comment was relating to what uh, Professor Rashmi had said about the Unidhruva Convention. She mentioned that India is not a party. Now, why is India not a party to it? Because 
we have a problem with some of the provisions. Like once you come to know the whereabouts of a stolen property or illegally exported property, there is a time limit within which you must file your claim. And not only once you come to know, this applies even when you are deemed to have knowledge. So this is a very difficult condition to meet. Because as I mentioned yesterday about the Nataraja case, it took about a decade of litigation. The government of India was awarded 800,000 pounds as costs. So if that is the kind of cost for one case, for one to recover one cultural object, how many of the developing countries are in a position to actually initiate the, list, the litigation to recover all the guns? Even if they have the knowledge, even if they have the proof, do they have the resources to undertake that? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Narendra Singh, for your very fruitful uh, and additional information. So now I'd like to, to close this uh, uh, panel uh, by thanking all of the panelists for your very insightful presentation and explanation on many issues on the uh, return of cultural property. So please give them a big hand. <laughs> Sorry to exceed a little bit the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, you all.